Our musical origins go back to 1969 when I first met Sipo and he taught me all I know about Zulu street guitar music. He'd like to play for you a very special song. It's called Inkunza Ihlabi Ngogumisa, which means don't judge a bull by its horns. Well, he wasn't a typical South African boy. I, I'd gone to six different schools in three different countries in five years. He was born in England and then I took him to Rhodesia uh, to my father's farm because I was getting divorced. And then I married a journalist and we went to live in Zambia. So his first school was a multiracial school in Zambia. My stepfather was a crime reporter and he took me into Alexander Township when I was nine. Um, he had made friends with a preacher there and on Sundays he would go in and teach the bugle band. There was an Alexander bugle band and he was a drummer so he taught drumming to the, to the drumming section. So I would go in there in a classroom and sit very quietly because I was very really shy and watch these young black kids being taught by my stepfather. Dan had been the only father he knew. I mean his real father was in England. You know he never knew his father which is a very interesting thing for me uh, and, and in a way you know the fact that he didn't know his father, I didn't know my father and he was my father but in the end I was like a little brother to him. You know, I felt because he used to confide in me, not as a son. He used to confide in me as another young male, in a way. Um, and sometimes I could handle it, other times it was a bit of a burden. At that stage, when he was 15 or 16, he actually considered himself a young Zulu man. He didn't want to know about whites. I mean, he'd actually say to me, you whites, you think this and you think that, as if he wasn't white. Most kids grow up on either side of the divide, saying that's the other side, that's the stranger, that's the shadow. That's the unpredictable. Uh, there's a darkness there. It never was presented to me as a threatening world. Uh, we're in Jeppe Hostel in Johannesburg. Um, this is a typical little meat, a meat station where you, if you are hungry, you come and you get uh, fresh uh, meat. As a youngster, I used to often eat at these stations and I just ordered uh, a piece of meat which uh, looks like it's the heart of an ox. Um, for old time's sake. <laughs> It's a very hard life, it's a tough life, it's a, you need to be a warrior to live in a hostel. England. in Manchester. Oh, Baba, no ma. Yeah. But the force. I was first arrested at Wemo Hostel when I was 15, and I was in a in a in a room with 60 men, 
and the police had raided there because they raid all the time for weapons and illegal, you know, there's illegal goods being traded and stolen goods and stuff. And they came into this room and the room is smaller than this and all the beds are pushed up against the wall. And these men are sitting very tightly packed in between each other. There's, they, they sit on the floor and there's a guy here and there's a guy in front of him. There's about five in a row like sitting. And I was right at the back in one of these rows. And then the guy spotted me and he was absolutely shocked. And he, he called, he said, hey, are you right? And I said, no, I'm fine. He said, what are you doing here? I said, no, I'm dancing. And you could see that it, it wasn't in, in his universe possible. He says, you can't do this and this and that and whatever. You know, it's against the law. This is a group, a black area. You can't come in and you're underage. And, you know, uh, and, I, and he said, we can't arrest you because you're a kid. We're taking you back home to your mom now. Come. So we, we went back to my mom and she opened the door. Now I'm standing between two cops. They, they'd say to me, are you this boy's mother? I said, yes, I am. Does you know where we found him? I uh, think I know. It was either um, dancing at the, outside the medical school or maybe at the hostel. He says, uh, do you know how dangerous that place is? They say, listen, you know, first of all, it's illegal. Second of all, Every weekend we take out bodies out of there. There's faction fights, there's things going on. This kid is in the middle of, you know, these are wild tribesmen from, from Natal. So I said, well, he tells me that he's quite safe and I believe him. Soweto traffic police man roadblocks. And on top of Baraguanath Hospital's pedestrian bridge, riot police keep watch. There's so much more out in the world, in my country, which had been cut off from me by law, by apartheid, which said, you can't go there. You can't meet these people. Uh, they're in another area. And um, if, you know, every, every kind of structural, political, and, 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 and geographic effort is made to separate everybody. And I had to break through that. The world is full of strange behavior. Every man has to be his own savior. I know I can make it on my own if I try. But I'm searching for a great heart to stand me by underneath the African sky. A great heart to stand me by I'm searching for the spirit of the great heart To hold and keep me by I'm searching for the spirit of the great heart Under African skies Sometimes I feel that you really know me I knew that my behaviour was criminalised by a white society. I didn't know why. You know, when you see a fence as a young person, the normal reaction to a fence is, oh, there's a fence here. Uh, where's the hole in the fence? How high is the fence? Can I jump over the fence? The more perceptive position is why is there a fence? And I never asked that question initially. Why am I being stopped? I just knew I was being stopped so I had to find a way around it. the South African government's racial policy is right. I really do, because we cannot mix with the lower nations. 
at the moment, unless they are cultivated and educated and so on. I actually felt sometimes more threatened by white people in the street because they had sometimes attacked us and we had to run away sometimes, me and Sipo. Uh, just normal white citizens, you know, who'd be, like, they'd be offended. We'd walk through Hillbrow playing guitar together and people would shout stuff and chase us. They are the lower class, they work under us, so it is just right that they must be there. And they made me feel bad because it was more of a, a social rather than, a, than a, a legal, you know, legal is quite sort of formal with the police. I'm just doing my job and I'm arresting you because the law says this. But when somebody who's eating a, a wimpy hamburger or whatever, you know, suddenly sees you, wipes his mouth and says, Yay! What you doing? You know, you, you, it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a white citizen, <laughs> you know, who's looking at you and saying, this is what you're doing is like absolutely offends him. He's totally affronted and, and offended by what you're doing. That I found very hard to deal with. I always saw myself as a cultural activist, not as a political activist. And there is a slight difference between the two, because when you when you're working in culture, you're giving meaning and you're giving significance and um, agency, the power to affect the world, to culture, not to political action. You're saying that there's something in culture, there's something in dance, there's something in art, there's something in music that can make a deeper understanding of the human condition. That can help to um, uh, connect people to an understanding of what's going on. And you, and you don't have to, you don't have to, you know, come out with strident slogans. You can do it in a, in a song, in a story, in a narrative, and you can move people. Music changed me. It affected me. I could feel. I could feel me as I was listening. I could feel. I had a goosebump here, and I could feel. I could, and I suddenly, my, my mind was invaded by the narrative of the song, and I was really imagining things. So it, it's in you. It comes into you. Those are those are powerful things. Now, when I first heard Bob Dylan. Uh, times they were changing when I was a young person. Um, I, I had these unformulated, unarticulated uh, feelings about those things, and he put it straight into lyric and say clear, clear cut statements of, of the struggle of a young person to find their place in a new world. It's something you grab on as a young person, it's a, an anchor. Uh, and, and enables you to feel that what you're feeling is not incorrect uh, and, and that there's a place for you because everybody's struggling and everybody's feeling the same thing that you're feeling. <laughs> hey you puppy! Hey you puppy! You know the story about putting the, the frog in, in warm water and then, and then cooking it? and the frog actually not realizing that it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter and accommodating itself. In a way, that's what we did to apartheid, the, the, the government here, because we started as just these, these two teenagers, this, this boy and these two boys, this duo, Johnny and Sipa. And they knew we were operating, but we were operating within a, a limited sphere. And we were not really, you know, we were not really having the impact that they, that they thought we would be having. When we had the first record out, uh, it was difficult to promote and uh, you know we had discussions about well how are we going to get the word out and obviously the idea was that if they could go out and play with the full band and perform they would get th that was the way of finding an audience. The period between 1976 and 1979 where we decided to make a band that's when the things got got tougher for us. South Africa in 1979 having a multiracial band was not the easiest thing to to do. Do you want Jaluka? Uh, I remember at one point maybe uh, Sipo arriving at, uh, at a show, limping and saying that he'd been chased by the police and he'd jumped off a bridge onto the M1 at some point because uh, 
I don't even know why at that point they were chasing him, but you know, he went that night and sat on the stage because he, you know, I think he'd broken his hip. And that's when we had problems with shows being closed down, police coming on stage with weapons and forcing the audience out the hall. They would allow the audience to pay their money. And these are township dwellers and that money is hard come by. They would allow them to pay, the audience would go into the hall, the promoter would take the money and run. Three songs into the show, they closed the show down. So the audience had paid, they never saw the show. So the audience would say, oh, we love you, Luca, but don't go to a show because you're going to see three songs. So we had those kind of issues to deal with. And so how we did that is we said, well, how do the police know that we're playing here? Well, because the entire township is bannered. And they even put banners in the, in the, in the town. So I said, well, then don't put banners up. Don't let them know. The sky is bleeding. Two or three or four days before the show, you put a, a speaker on the car, and then you, you drive through the township and say, Chuluka will be here in three days' time. That's how we did it. And then the people would see the truck arrive, because it was very important that they saw the truck even more than the band. When they saw the big, the big three, four ton truck with the big Jaluka sign on it outside the, the school hall, ah, they knew that the game was on. Bye bye December African When you perform in the street, the fact that you put yourself at risk just walking down the street singing music as an artist, you're putting yourself at risk. You're not framed in, in a special arena. You're in the world. You're flowing through the world in the street. You're going through the community and you're singing. So it's, it feels very natural. And the thing for me when we, when we first played was the unnaturalness of being platformed. I enjoyed it later on, but initially I thought, you know, it's too much distance and, you know, I'm up here and they're down there and I just feel weird because normally, you know, you walk and you play and you meet people, you chat. So we took that out of the flow of life and the dance. We took it out of the flow of the hostel, out of the flow of the natural context and put it onto a stage, which was hard for me. Suddenly we were being looked at, you know what I mean, I felt very like a bit of a zoo vibe. Uh, but you know, um, we had a great response. Obviously the whole production value of the live show started growing but still very naively you know it, it was it wasn't like there was a choreographer or a producer of the show this was just how it was growing out of whatever they were making we experimented with all with so many different kinds of crossovers uh, just on the visual side uh, people uh, especially overseas when you appear on stage people say what is this you know and they would come and we put a white shawl on our arms and say why are they wearing white wigs one of the comments was, this band wears white wigs on its arms. It was a code. We were talking in a code of dress. It was a dress code that we were developing, which said, 
Let's just mix the West and Africa and the urban and the rural and the white and the black. Find various ways to do that. In the early days, the, the stories of the songs were all about a passion, trying to recount what was going on in the various lives around him. I've always wanted to sing about the South African experience. That has been my main subject matter. This is like the Zulu sang about what they saw walking down the street. I was trying to sing about the Zulu war, about African sky blue. The idea of a black migrant worker and a white university professor working together, the problems that they encountered in South Africa at that time, and their vision of what the future of South Africa could be. The song MP was basically banned, I think, by the SABC. They wouldn't play it. But it became an anthem in, uh, you know, in the townships. And then later on, the band, uh, the Jaluka, won an award at Radio Zulu for that song. Even though I'm not, I'm not quite sure at that point that the uh, the people in charge understood what the meaning of MP was to the people in the streets. You know, it's a song about warriors, and uh, it literally was a war cry for the kids in the streets. And in the morning, as they saddled up to ride, their eyes shone with the fire and the steel. I've always, in my, in my writing, I've always uh, tried to find ways to explore um, a political issue within a broader framework of an individual's experience about this terrible paradox that we live in in, in, in apartheid. We actually, we have people who are enforcing a system here against another group of people who are citizens of the country. It's a hidden war. Human nature is a dark thing. It is, uh, the, the, being a human being uh, is, is, a, is a tremendous battle to fulfill your obligations as a human being uh, and to control um, your, your desires and to control um, your lusts for power and your lust for recognition and your lust uh, to, to, to control others. Obviously, Cruel Crazy was an important song. Uh, it's the birth of my son. It was for Jesse. But it, it, it's, it's a song, it's a struggle song. He was born in a time and a frame of reference that was a struggle one. So the lyrics are little sentences to him to say life is a struggle 
uh, it wasn't you know a, a song of love or a parent you know uh, sort of intimate and loving sentiments it was a song based on the realities of where he lives and where, where he was born and what he was born to and what his what his inheritance will be So the lyrics in there are saying it's a cruel, a crazy, but it's a beautiful world. Uh, and the beauty is um, tempered by those other factors. And you will experience loneliness, you'll experience hopelessness, you'll experience these things. But I, I hope to be able to give you a map to help you guide yourself through all of this as your dad. It's a struggle to be a man. And this is a, this is a, uh, a motif in Zulu society. It is difficult to be a man. There are so many conflicting pressures on you that to be the man you want to be is will be a moment it'll it, it's not something you will ever achieve it'll be an event where it will be a consummated momentarily and celebrated and then and then dissipate again into this constant struggle between um, your fears your courage your your, your security uh, your idea of yourself the kind of status you want the, the, the kind of position you want to have in your in your group of other men and, and in the picking order of power relations between men. I got a lot of confidence as a youngster from karate um, as a system of movement. And Zulu dancing is the same because it's also a martial art. And Zulu dancing is war dancing. So I had already a kind of a template when I went into the dance. I looked immediately for the structure. It wasn't random movements that, that, that they were osmosing to each other, you know. There was a set choreography and that choreography had a structure and there was a pleasure that they were getting which I recognized. That first album of Savuka is very important because it's not only a, a record, it's a historical record of that time in South Africa. And trying to find ways to universalize art. Because it was also important for me that somebody overseas could listen to this and say, I get it. Not to say this is cryptic South African internal mysticism, you know. Uh, this is, any human being can understand this and can understand that yearning or can understand that feeling of wanting to be together or wanting to uh, um, reach out or whatever. So uh, those, those, were, those were for me uh, the imperatives as a writer in, the, in, the, in that very dark political moment. In 86, when we launched our album, uh, the first state of emergency was declared. Good evening. The state president, Mr. P. W. Borter, has announced a state of emergency in 36 magisterial districts. We saw images, terrible images, on, on the news. In unrest at Sakana on the East Rand, the death toll has risen to 11, with eight people killed in factional violence. We had reached a point now where the system w w was going to have to either fight for its, its life 
the current system and, and destroy everything. And if it did destroy anything, everything, we would be in serious trouble. Uh, and on, on the other side, if they, if they didn't destroy everything, then there would have to be a completely new a future for everybody. So we were on the cusp that, that 86, when those state of third, because there was two state of emergency, there was one that was just, I think, 36 districts or 19 districts, and then about four or five months later, the whole of South Africa was under a state of emergency. In a state of emergency, extensive powers are given to all security forces. These include arrest without a warrant and detention without trial. That's when Asimbo Nanga came out. The one song that stands out through the entire career is Asimbo Nanga. I remember it was in between Jaluka and Savuka and Johnny had put the band together to, to do some shows at the Market Theatre and we had just recorded a, a solo album but weren't quite sure where things were going and uh, I went down to the rehearsal for these live shows and he said, you know, I've just written something which I'd like you to hear and uh, played a Simbonanga and the hair stood up on the back of my neck uh, and I said to him that the beauty of having one's own studio was you could just do what you wanted I said, I, I'm not sure why we're doing this, what we're doing with it. It doesn't sound like a commercial record to me, but we should record this immediately. There, there are hundreds of songs that are written for Nelson, but they are, they're quite strident. Set him free, set him free, or whatever it is. One moment that really stands out for me was standing at the Zenith Theatre in Paris, and uh, Asimbo Nanga had started breaking as a big hit there. And I was standing at the back of the theater and uh, wasn't sure how the audience was going to respond. You know, I mean, the show had been incredible, but uh, this small pin spotlight was on Johnny's face and he just went, Asim Bonanga. Asim Bonanga. Asim Bonanga. And spontaneously, I don't know, eight, ten thousand Frenchmen, hands in the air. Bonang is singing in Zulu with their lighters, you know, in the, in the air. It was just a hair-raising moment. Asim Munang was a song of yearning. It was something deeper. It was not just, uh, let's find a way to send a message that this must be done, which is what most of the slogans are about. This was about a feeling, a yearning, that somehow this, this distance that we, that we have between him and us is a metaphor for the distance between everybody in the country. Who has words to close the distance? He's on the island and we're on the mainland. There's all these metaphors. There's an island. No man is an island. And when, when he crosses that water and he comes back to the mainland, that is a moment in which we can find a way to move forward. There's Mr. Mandela, Mr. Nelson Mandela, a free man taking his first steps into a new South Africa. That is the man who the world has been waiting to see.
His first public appearance in nearly three decades. 72 years old. One of the problems with, with all struggle culture and struggle sloganeering and struggle music and, is that it's exclusive. It sets absolute demands that you accept this or uh, it, it's not suggestive and it's not, it's not trying to include and to say even though you're on the other side, there's a place for you here. It's just a matter of your attitude. Can you just see this picture and see this picture this way and see this picture this way? I'm just showing you moments of things that you should look at in a slightly different way. Uh, step, just step over here for a while. Have a look at this. That is far more powerful than finger pointing and saying, if you're not here on this side, then you that. This is what you are. I remember you know, he and Sipo had gone to Europe to play in some cultural event and uh, came back and he said, you know, I, had, I have this idea for a song and I remember him sitting playing this guitar riff and singing the song and we thought, well, this is, this is amazing and we started trying to construct how the band should play this and they were so, again, this was typical of the, the fact that, you know, it was from the heart what was coming out because when you listen to that guitar riff, there's, it, it doesn't make musical sense. It sounds incredible, but if you really count the beats, I think seven, four, nine, eight, you know, we couldn't find what the different uh, instrumentalists should play. Obviously, a Simbonanga stands out for me, but if you talk about the seminal Juluka song or Johnny Clegg song that really started everything, then obviously you have to, to look to Scatlings. I was born in England, but I came back to Africa, which is the birthplace of all humanity. It is the cradle of mankind. Scatlings of Africa is a song which celebrates that and says that all human beings on the planet are essentially African in origin. The sun sinking low. Scatterlings and fugitives Hooded eyes and weary brow See the future in the night And all the scatterlings are back to go Each up wounded one On the road to Panama There's one, there's one thing I just thought about, which uh, maybe I should talk about. I remember when we came back from England, uh, when Scatlings was a hit, having a show, I think it was at the Coliseum Theatre, and uh, one of those defining moments for me was that uh, the band, uh, the, the audience was told, you have to sit down during the show, even though everyone wanted to stand up and dance, uh, because of the theatre rules, maybe the fire department or whatever. But slowly, as it came to the end of the show, the audience started standing up and moving to the sides of the theatre, standing on the sides. And when Scatlings came on, these two conga lines just appeared on each side of the theatre and started dancing towards the stage and came across the stage and met just in front of Johnny and Sipo. And it just so happened the guy in this, the front of this one side was a white guy, the guy on the other side was a black guy. And they met in the middle, put their arms around each other and danced and the audience went crazy. 
and uh, we realized South Africa was changing. Johnny had been a classical musician or, you know, a trained, uh, studied musician, I'm sure that a lot of the things he did might have turned out radically differently. This was just things that were coming out of, really coming from the heart. Johnny is one of the brightest people I've ever come across. You know, he, his ability to talk on numerous subjects or most subjects and, you know, the amount of reading he does and uh, his, his knowledge of so many different subjects is, is incredible. And, you know, he, he certainly approaches a lot of things from, from an intellectual point of view. But uh, I think, you know, for someone who had so many setbacks and so many uh, moments of pain, uh, I suppose the, the way he was able to, to deal with those was through his music. These were, these were you know, um, moments which were uh, very, very, very hard moments. You, you, yeah, you know, during 1990, 1990 to 1994, I lost 20 or 30 friends of mine, just migrant workers who were just shot and killed in the violence. Often you have to look underneath and in between the lines to really see, you know, where the pain is coming through. Through all the days that eat away the crossing is just a, a, an incredible example of uh, the pain that was felt uh, on, on Dudu's death. Dudu uh, was a very close friend of Johnny's who was also uh, a dancer with both Chuluka and Savuka. So he was a close friend and business or, you know, and uh, artistic partner for many, many years. And he was killed uh, in Zululand in a very unfortunate uh, circumstance. Amazing. Then you, you you listen to the song, and in a way, it sounds hopeful. A punch drunk man in a downtown bar. We've come through an incredible time, you know. When we look back at, at, at what we what we were moving through, and what things, how those things, aspects of those things touched my life. You know, I I, I wake up every day and I think, you know, this country is a remarkable place. It really, is a remarkable place. And my son. I try and tell him, but I know that my 10 year old, you know, for him, it's hard for them. It's like listening to your dad about the Second World War, you know, you know, you, it's, it's such a distance and the meaning that you give it, they look at you, you know, and say, geez, you know, this old guy's really trapped in those times, you know what I'm saying? But they were so intense and they shaped us, you know, at every second of our lives.
is a, a wonderful expression I love in Zulu, which is which um, the dry grass is made green again by fire. And it's through the fire of experience that you're made new, that you learn, that you become refreshed. It is through struggle and it's through hardship and it's through overcoming difficult odds that you are reinvigorated and reinvent yourself. And we say Uguzaka, to build yourself, to invent yourself. When you go into the dance, we are Zaka, you build yourself, you invent, you present yourself in a new way. And all of these things are part of a, of a, of a deep um, system of values related to a, a, a perspective on life as a man. And dry grass is made new with fire, you know, that's it. Uh, you burn the grass and in, in a week's time, little green grass starts coming out again. The grass is frisk and new and looking, and, and the whole area looks wonderful. We're at uh, a park which is uh, about three blocks away from Jeppe Hostel. And these dance teams have come together to celebrate the closing down of a successful year of dancing in the hostel. I just came here to um, say hello and to reinforce and to support the fact that traditional dancing is still an important aspect of uh, daily life amongst the migrants. realize that in the late 80s Johnny Clegg was by far the biggest artist in France uh, there's uh, stories about the uh, you know two stadiums in Lyon being booked one on the same night one by Johnny one by Michael Jackson and Johnny selling out 45,000 and Jackson cancelling the show because of a lack of ticket sales and the French press saying it appears that the uh, the French people prefer the white man who wants to be black than the black man who wants to be white 